Good evening. Uh, tonight's February 22nd, 2018, Winthrop School Committee. Uh, I'd like to ask WHS Student Council to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And after if we can remain standing for a moment of silence as we remember the victims of Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules uh, and we go out of order so we could hear uh, the WHS Student Council overnight travel request. Second. Second by Mr. Martucci. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any discussion? The ayes have it. You guys have the floor. Hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Ferrara. I'm the Student Council President. Um, we were asking for your permission to attend, um, to travel down to Hyannis Cape Cod to attend the 41st annual um, Massachusetts Association of Student Councils annual spring conference. Um, this is a three day, two night conference held at the resort and conference center at Hyannis and the Cape Cod Hotel. Um, the three days are filled with motivational speeches, workshops, awards, and entertainment, and um, the, our delegation is made up of 20 kids, 16 girls, four boys, um, accompanied by our advisors, Jen Riley and Dan Curran, two teachers at Winthrop High School. Um, we will be staying at the resort and conference center at Hyannis between the dates of March 7th through the 9th. Um, and all of the students are responsible for missed work that will, when we return to school Monday, March 12th. What are you hoping to accomplish there? Um, the whole idea is basically we um, we elect a new state board. So um, there's about 18 kids running from 79 schools throughout um, the, the state that are going to the conference. And there's 18 <coughs> kids running, and we elect um, a president, vice president, and secretary, and four delegates. So that's basically why we go. That's the and you do some you do some activities around team building. Yeah, mostly like team that. building. It's a lot of council building, and then we um, meet a bunch of kids and get a whole bunch of ideas from councils around the state. What's the, what's the history of being able to maintain relationships with kids from other communities from being part of student? Well, I personally, um, I've made lifelong friends yeah. through the whole thing. Yeah. So it's just a good experience, especially for like the new kids too. They mm -hmm. get to meet new kids and it's, a good, it's an awesome way to step out of your comfort zone. Yeah. How can you bring that back to the kids at WHS and help them experience some of the things that you experience. It definitely helps us, especially with our freshman orientation, when we when there's new kids coming into our school, and then it helps us plan a lot of our projects better after we see what different schools are doing. Um, so it helps us a lot get, it helps us a lot with um, participation throughout the school. Very good. We have an awesome Stuco group every year, you know, just ton tons of kids that get very involved and I think her point about coming outside your comfort zone is huge because there are a lot of students that don't may not participate in athletics, may not participate in, in a club or an activity in the school but they're very invested uh, in this organization and in meeting with other students from other communities you get such a wider array of other kids and, it, and you have the opportunity to sit and, and sort of be yourself around other people who have no Sort of judgment of you because they don't know you, um, and then there's those friendships that you build um, in going to projects like this or conferences like this, and then their their own public speaking abilities, uh, being able to be a part of a group where you're supported while you're speaking allows you to come back to school committee meetings <laughs> and speak uh, well in front of adults and not just your peers. Um, some of the strongest kids I've I've ever met and and heard some really cool stories about what the organization has done for them personally, and then how they've shared that back. I mean, I think of, of Hunter mm -hmm. Gillis, who was in uh, my daughter Gretchen's grade, and boy, he went, he grew from being this kind of quiet little guy, not really quiet, but somewhat quiet little guy, to just really self-confident um, and a great advocate for public education and, and just students in general and empowerment. Um, so congratulations to you guys, one for, for coming to this meeting to request it, but also being able to explain what it is and sort of what it does for you guys. 
So I recommend it. Too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think this is a great program and I was so excited to hear about it, but because I was so excited, I kind of goofed up, so we forgot to call the roll. So before we do it, <laughs> like, oh, do you mind if we take care of that first? <laughs> uh, Mr. Fabiano, Mr. Matucci, yep. Ms. Powell, present, Ms. Swope, yep. Mr. Vecchia, present, Mr. Perrin, Mr. Capabianco. Here. Now that we did that, I'd like to make a motion <laughs> to uh, approve the request. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Powell. Any further discussion? No, just if we all set on um, chaperones. Good. Yes. Numbers good. Yeah, numbers are good. Yeah. Make that fun, guys. Make us, Make us proud. Make us proud. All in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. They have homework. <laughs> homework to get to. And, and games. And whose game is tonight? Uh, girls basketball. basketball. Uh, the game. Uh, the <coughs> All right. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Have fun. <laughs> right. Do we have any further delegates or visitors tonight? No. Any public comments? No. I'd like to make a, a motion to approve the minutes of the February 12th, uh, 2018 meeting. Mm -hmm. Motion by Ms. Swope. Any discussion on the, that motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, moving on, I'd uh, like to make a motion to approve warrant SVW 18-14 in the amount of $187,811.42. Motion. Motion by Mr. Matucci. Second. Seconded by Ms. Swoops. Any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, we do have two payroll warrants tonight. Uh, first warrant is SPW 18-14 in the amount of $668,343.12. Also payroll, payroll warrant SPW 18-15 in the amount of $670,591.84. Sorry, that's a tongue twister. So I have a motion to uh, approve both of these together. So Second. moved. Second, uh, second by Ms. Pa uh, motion by Ms. Powell, seconded by Mr. Vecchia. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, we do have a budget transfer request in the amount of $23,307.58. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the budget transfer? Motion. Motion by Mr. Matucci. Second. Seconded by Ms. Swope. Any discussion on the motion? If I may. Uh, yep just fill you in a little bit on the transfer so for those of you who have sat through a number of meetings with me this is the task that we go through uh, daily but uh, bring it to you once a month to try to equalize the lines and make sure we're following day by day what's in each line item where monies are needed um, and do that consistently so that we are not waiting to the end if you see the larger uh, transfer from the contingency account to therapies therapies for just clarification um, is a line item that covers uh, such service delivery as additional speech and language, uh, additional occupational therapy for students, perhaps a, um, an extended evaluation that may take place that obviously would not have been budgeted for uh, in, in which a student may be going out for services for a short period of time. Um, I just wanted you to know what the actual money transfer uh, was. So there's an anticipated cost uh, before us of about $20,000 in additional services that uh, we deem necessary to cover and the contingency account is where we'd like to go for that. All right, so all in favor of the budget transfer? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. All right, moving on with the agenda. Uh, we do have an anticipated vote on the proposed budget, and I was wondering, if Ms. Howard, if you could update us with uh, the sure. budget. So the proposed um, budget, I've met um, a few times with the subcommittee for finance to talk about uh, the budget thoughts moving forward for the 2018-2019 school year. Um, we've discussed during that process how we came to the conclusion of what a level service budget may uh, look like as well as what a needs-based budget would look like. I worked with the committee um, to explain to them the process that brought us to the conclusion of what the needs would be and the fact that the needs budget is not a wish list of things that we wish we could have. Um, we certainly have wishes. Uh, however, these are items included in this needs-based budget that you have before you 
that would allow us to not only continue to provide the appropriate service um, for our students, um, but stay equivalent to other school districts around us and to get us um, to continue to make the progress that we have been making. And so a combination of working with the principals of, on their current budget and what they perceive as needs for the future, working with the facilities <coughs> department, custodial staff, paraprofessionals, uh, classroom teachers, principals, we held a few different, um, I held a few different informational seminars with teachers after speaking with principals, being able to come back to them and give them a copy of of a, a, a breath of what the principals were speaking about in their individual building, asked them for some feedback as to what they saw as a, a need for their school, um, and all the time working on these different uh, budget thoughts with facilities and guidance and teachers and um, ESPs and principals, um, data was what was driving their decision. So if, if there was a thought that there was an extra ESP needed there was lots of poking going on as to why that person was needed, what did the class size look like, how many students would that person need to service. And that was the same right down to facilities and looking at um, different contracts that we have, uh, extending those contracts, what those contracts would look like long term, how they would fare out if they were a three year contract versus a one year contract and bringing some data back to support uh, if there was any cost savings available there. Um, this is the first step in um, our budget process, is looking at our needs and requesting um, what we feel is a budget that would support our students and teaching staff and is in the best interest of the Winter Public Schools. Once this committee votes um, to accept or, or approve this particular uh, request, then that goes to uh, the town uh, for a request to the town and um, we'll go through several meetings after that and justifying these budget requests. And then once the town is able to give us a final figure uh, as to what the town is capable of providing, um, then we go back to the table and, and begin the work of prioritizing um, our budget needs based on the amount of money that we receive. Um, what, I, what I can articulate to you is that the principals and the, the staff um, have become well aware of what our budget looks like and what's in each line item and how each line item is used. That's been part of the discussions that we've been having, which for some was, was a new topic. They hadn't really looked at that before. Uh, I feel like it was educational so that they know where the dollars are being spent. We tied people to an actual dollar amount of salary so they were aware of, and then what do those people do? Um, talked a little bit about out-of-district tuitions talked a lot about some efficiencies that we've created this year and what the plan is for, you know, when you create some efficiencies, you free up some, some uh, dollars in different areas and how we may be able to use uh, those dollars. And at the end, um, it was a general consensus that the team of, of staff members here are very mindful of the amount of money that the community has as a whole and, and working with the town council and the counselors and the other entities, the fire, the police, the DPW. Um, those are a very tight group of people that work very closely together. I can attest to that. I spend a tremendous amount of time with the chief of police, the town manager, the fire chief, the town workers. Um, and I do feel like people have a very strong understanding of each other's needs based on what we have been going through with the interim town manager and soon now appointed uh, as the full-time town manager so that each department is aware of the position that everybody else is in. Um, so I felt the need to really articulate our true needs without any type of a wish list so that when we come to the, to the final day where we're discussing the actual amount of money we have, uh, we're all on the same page uh, as to our understanding of the town's budget as a whole. And so the budget that you have before you, I believe, is a solid reflection of what Winter Public Schools does need in order uh, to, to move forward. And so I ask that uh, you approve that budget. I first of all want to thank you for all of this work. I mean, it's uh, and your explanations are clear, and uh, I feel very confident that you've done the right kind of vigilant work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We still we have, we have a lot, long way to go once you know we're given a final figure. But um, I feel I would be um, remiss if I didn't explain to folks, to everybody, and that's people in the community that I've spoken with as well as our own staff, as to what our true needs are. Mm -hmm. And then as we move forward with what we're given, 
we'll be able to sort of readjust that and, and focus our priorities and then come back and explain that here is the amount of money that we've received, here are the priorities that we have uh, worked together as a team, as a leadership team and as a school community to identify as the direction that we are going given the support that we have and then be able to assess our <coughs> progress based on that. Um, so I, I feel like that picture will be very clear to people as we move forward. And then if we're asking questions about items that we couldn't fund because we didn't have the, the means to do so, uh, at least there will be an explanation of why we felt we needed it. If we don't get it, where did that money end up being prioritized to? And then what is our intent to cover you know, that need as, as we move forward, uh, whether that be the next year uh, or with other supports that we'll continue to seek uh, through grant funding and, and whatnot. So, I had a couple of discussions with um, the town manager, and I don't, and what we, we did was here, we, we broke out the um, fringe benefits part. Like last year was the first year that they um, added fringe benefits into our uh, budget, and I don't think that that's going to change the way it sounds to me. We, w we wanted to see if we could get them to take it back, but I'm not, I don't think it's going to happen this year. So the number that will be on the uh, needs budget would be that the twenty six uh, million ninety ninety three thousand six hundred forty seven dollars. Just say one thing. Sure. When we vote this, though, we only vote the operating budget. Okay. Okay. I mean, the the, the fringe part, even though it's part of our budget, yeah. we don't really. That's not part of the operating budget. Okay. So when we vote. We vote on that, and that's what we move forward. So we're not so we're not going to vote on right. Because we don't have any control over that money anyway. They kind of designate that. So, yeah, so that's but CFO. When we put this in the newspaper and everything, last year, historically, we've always used the operating budget. I just wanted so to So it'll be that. the, uh, the, the 21. 675-488. Correct. And, and the, okay. the town CFO um, and town manager determine what the, the benefits <coughs> amount of money is going to be. And if you look at past budgets, some it can be somewhat confusing because the past two school years, those figures did not change. So last year and the year before, they changed slightly, um, maybe a couple of hundred dollars. And so there's a dramatic difference in the change for this year. Um, and that is because we're asking very specific questions about the total number of people we have. And I would like that number to reflect the actual people who take insurance, uh, the 204 people who are accessing insurance, I'm going to predict that those same amount of people will be taking insurance next year. But the significant jump is, this is an, this is an adjusted figure. It's a two-year adjustment. Because if the line items didn't change last year, so from 2015-16, just about the same amount was moved to 17-18. To to if those numbers di didn't change, yet the people changed, the offset wasn't made in a, in a timely way. So it looks a lot larger than it actually is. It's actually a reflection of two years of change and not just one. And I can go through uh, that with the committee if, if need be, with the subcommittee to show you, and I think I, I, think I did show yeah. folks that initially. It, it does also sound to me that they're going to do exactly what you just said and, and not just put a number there that they did last year. Correct. But actually put a real fringe benefit numbers. number that ties into the the amount of the number of employees. Correct. And, and we did receive some information today that was um, from um, GIC that was helpful in terms of predicting. Uh, I think initially we had a, a prediction that GIC was going to go up about eight, eight or ten percent. Am I correct? And um, thinking that, and that number has come down quite a bit. Uh, I believe it's come down to about two percent, which I don't bet for good reason, but. I would like to see that in actual, like a contract that says it's not changing before I hang my hat on it because things change every day in, in that world. But as of right now, we're being told it's not going to be the significant increase that we anticipated. Um, so that's that would affect those bottom numbers maybe a little bit. But again, the operating budget itself uh, would be the two the needs based operating budget. Would be twenty one million six hundred and seventy five thousand four hundred and eighty eight thousand, uh, which compared to the seventeen eighteen operational budget, which was nineteen million three hundred forty one thousand three hundred and ten dollars. 
So that is for um, needs-based. And then the additional fringe benefits uh, are the offset on the bottom would bring the entire budget to 26 million as opposed to 22, close to 23 for this year. That would be a two million three hundred thirty-four thousand one hundred seventy-eight dollar increase from last year's budget. So, including the French, as a full, correct? No. Is that what you're talking about? No, I'm doing, doing oh, the, 19 to yeah, the nineteen to twenty. Yep. Um, so that's the reason why we'd have to like have this um, level service uh, budget, you know ready to go because that's it's a pretty high number the but but the thing is that I'm sorry you're saying the two million is a pretty high number yeah it's it's high for us you know to think that we may get that we're gonna try because you know again we're charged with advocating for, for schools and students um, what's the biggest driver of that increase um, steps, probably in, steps in lanes yeah, steps, you, the steps in lanes of, of teachers are those the uncontrollable costs so you have contracted services so step in lanes of teachers um, contracts that we have for services such as uh, the internet service providers the technology department um, a little bit of that is uh, special ed tuition we have to look at really dig down the rate increases we have two uh, two students who are in programs that have program reconstruction which is another uncontrollable cost, which means that the Department of uh, Education, not the Department of Education, but Operational Service Division sets the rates on those schools, and they tell you about 10 months ahead of time when they're gonna change that rate, and it can be a significant change. Two of our schools are having a significant increase. Mm -hmm. um, and so you wouldn't move a child because of an increase in cost. You, that's not a justifiable reason to change a child's placement. It can be a discussion, but uh, in essence, that child has stay put rights to that spot. So you, you really have to anticipate that cost going up. I also have anticipated a decrease. We, lots of discussion following very closely circuit breaker reimbursement, which is the heartbeat of the special education out of district tuition uh, funding source. And, and there has been a tremendous amount of discussion. I think I included in your last packet some uh, lobbying that I was doing uh, on the Hill around keeping circuit breaker and fully funding it at 75% dropping it to 65% on a small district like this is a significant hit in reimbursement. And based on the way Winthrop uses the reimbursement, um, we use it in the year that it comes to us, which eventually will hopefully flip that table and, and do it a little differently, but a significant hit, drop a drop of 10% in circuit breaker uh, would be a, a significant hit to us. Um, so that's th those are the larger costs, those sort of uncontrollable um, you know, step and lane increases. And then, um, you know, the rest of the cost in the needs-based budget is uh, a handful of people, salaried people, in which the individual principals felt very strongly uh, that without certain staff members increasing, such as a social studies teacher um, at the middle school, a certified social studies teacher at the middle school, um, ELL teacher at the elementary, lower elementary, pre-K to two, without those positions um, and a few other positions that we discussed, um, it'll be very difficult to service the students and, and allow them to continue continue to maintain the class size that has you know been a, a continuous effort in this district. We made some nice progress on the Next Generation MCAS, showed that our students are faring well, um, and, and our goal as educators is, is to continue rising. And, and you know, fighting at all times unfunded mandates from the state that come across our desks every day. Um, and then really addressing some of the uh, social, emotional, and mental health concerns that we have with our students so that we can continue to help them move forward and, and survive in, in this world and move on and become uh, productive members of society, finding, following our mission and our goal uh, about educating every child. We've also had a significant increase in um, ELL population. Title I funds have been reduced, so we need to sort of take that roll all those uh, little things that we can't control. Uh, that's really the driver of the, of the budget. Um, but we feel as though that adding the staff members that we have requested will allow us to continue to make progress. Yes? Uh, is this 
reflective of, of any movement uh, in having a, cer a curriculum director? Yes. So um, the curriculum, one of the one of the needs that has come across um, just about every day is uh, the law. So this has the restoration of a, of a curriculum director with a different um, job description. So a director of curriculum instruction and accountability, which would uh, oversee not only curriculum K to 12, and then we're not talking about a curriculum specialist, somebody who's schooled in every area of curriculum K through 12, because that person really doesn't exist, but somebody that can help coordinate uh, the data, who can help align our professional development and make it targeted and, and uh, meaningful and responsive from our teachers. Uh, ELL oversight. So curriculum directors, because ELL is embedded, our ELL services are embedded in our curriculum, what we do with our students to, to uh, help them learn the language and, and move forward. Um, the director of curriculum and instruction and accountability is very appropriate to oversee the implementation of ELL services to make sure they're compliant, uh, consistent, um, and that we're following the ELL rules. There is no ELL pol police out there. And uh, which is somewhat unfortunate. Um, it's a it's a newer mandate. Um, we have some flaws in our service delivery and how we're doing it efficiently. I would expect the ELL core, uh, director. I would expect the director of curriculum and instruction would be able to make sure that those practices are consistent in every school, so that we're not confusing parents, and that our service delivery is equivalent in each building. Um, technology, integrated technology, is we have technology. Um, support systems here in the school that are amazing and and as as you know we don't utilize every bit of our technology in the way that we need to and so there's a difference between technology support and making sure that we are replacing Chromebooks and that we're taking care of our you know touch pads and our iPads and we're keeping on top of the maintenance of our and the contracts of our technology but there's a much bigger world out there of integrated technology which is given the device that we have, how can we utilize that to improve student learning? Um, and access to Chromebooks, uh, sorry, access to textbooks uh, and materials that, that are online and support systems that are online, videos that our students can, um, can access for learning, and then teaching teachers how, how to use that. Um, setting up systems where teachers can uh, YouTube how to utilize this piece of integrated technology. How can we utilize some of the <coughs> assessments that we're doing with our students in a more meaningful way that we can share vertically between the schools? So third grade, um, second grade to third grade, making sure we, we are, our curriculum is aligned and is uh, vertically shared <coughs> and, and assessed. So uh, that is in here, um, and that was uh, a restoration that we have been working on since I think I stepped through the door because I feel that that is um, one of the most critical needs that we have in order to move forward. Lisa, you also mentioned grants <coughs> as part of this person. I'm sorry? You also mentioned grants before. Sure, yeah, I mean, grant, grant management, especially um, seeking additional grants. So as, a, as somebody who actually enjoys writing grants, which is kind of nerdy, I know, but I do, I do enjoy that. There are entitlement grants that everybody's capable of receiving and those get posted on the department's website. But there's also uh, several grants out there that if in fact you have a keen awareness of what your instructional needs are, what your, um, what your student population is, what your ELL, your <coughs> Title I, your Title II population, what those parameters are in your school district, you can then seek additional grants for a school district that you might not otherwise know are out there. Um, the uh, curriculum coordinators have a subgroup of their own run by the state of Massachusetts, sort of, to, sort of similar to a superintendent's group, um, where they meet monthly with other curriculum directors in the Commonwealth to share ideas and share support. It's, it's a place that you, you go to learn about the things that either you don't know or meeting up with other school districts where you can partner on grants to gain your own small district, like this district, additional funding because you know somebody from uh, maybe Harvard, Mass, which would be a similar school that's small, that doesn't have lots of funding source, yet you both have a similar Title I or an ELL population, and your <coughs> size of your district enables you to get X grant. Curriculum coordinators get together to talk about 
those types of opportunities for school districts. Uh, we don't have that outreach right now, aside from me getting emails from the group to go to meetings that I can't go to. Um, and so I do believe we're missing opportunity <coughs> that we may be able to take advantage of. I have a couple of other questions. Um, I know Miller feel we haven't made an official decision whether it's going to be the town or the school, mm -hmm. but I'm assuming that the school department is going to <coughs> take over the maintenance. Correct. How is that reflected in the budget in terms of personnel and dollar-wise? Sure. So um, Matt uh, Serino, Matt Crombie, and myself have developed a Miller Field maintenance manual, um, and we've done that by looking at several schools that have put new fields in similar size, similar capacity, um, and similar structures, so uh, turf fields and, and the like, and, and field houses. Um, and we looked at their structures and how they took care of their fields. And there were many different um, setups. So some have Parks and Rec oversees the field. Some have um, the town uh, maintenance people that work just for the town in general, like facilities people for the town. Um, and, and several have just the school. And at first, we thought we were going to have to have a full-time person that would take care of all of that. And then as we dug deeper through old contracts and old, old teacher contracts, old custodial contracts, um, talked to the folks who put the field in and what the maintenance was going to entail, uh, and then started developing beyond the manual of field maintenance, the manual that would allow the um, manual that would allow us to rent the facility out and how that would be impacted and what type of personnel you would need for that if you were going to rent it out. So we do have a draft about the cost for that that I'll present to the school committee <coughs> after my next meeting with the town manager about uh, potentially returning the field to us. So we had um, felt strongly that a $15,000 stipend for an existing member of the faculty, whether that be um, a, a teacher, a coach, an administrator, somebody who um, could learn how to maintain that field. We've trained three people already on how to, it's actual long process about how to rake the field and fill it in with what it needs to be filled in with. Um, and there's a manual that comes with that. Uh, the uh, committee has given us a year, I believe if not more, maybe over a year of uh, support on, yes, yeah. on the turf <coughs> maintenance, on maintaining that turf. So whomever it is that could be that field maintenance person would then again also train under. So it's a year of training and maintenance. So they'll come down and they'll actually work with what person that's selected uh, and do the field maintenance with them so they actually get accustomed to doing it correctly for a full year. And so when looking at that, that person would be doing that and carrying that on from year to year. We looked at seasonally, three seasons that we have athletically, mm -hmm. um, and so a $5,000 stipend, because it is after school hours for the most part with the athletics, separate and distinct <coughs> from the athletic director's role, um, because there's setup that needs to be done, there's breakdown that needs to be done, there's security that needs to be taken care of, <coughs> opening and closing. We don't have our field house in yet, and the field house does come in and it is built. Um, there'll be maintenance around the field house. A few years, our custodial staff um, took care of the maintenance, and, and you know, it's a bigger facility, I understand that, so it will be more, uh, but we'll rely on that same um, form of, of activity and taking care of the, the cleanliness of, of the bathrooms and whatnot. Uh, when that field house is built. We we'll rely on our current staff uh, to do that. I believe we have time during the day uh, that we could fit that in. Um, two other items. Uh, transportation. You know, we had discussions last year about whether we were going to leave it the way it is. There's a potential we might need a new bus. Right. Buses are old, whatever. Uh, how is that addressed in the budget? So right now we have not, um, we have not changed it as of yet. And same, it's put in there to be run the same way it's being run um, this year. As we move forward, we'll have to have some more discussions on the uh, sort of the state of the buses and see, you know, how they are uh, faring and whether or not some of them are repairable. We're working on how much we've spent this year on uh, on gas and on repairs and on having to sub out some of our trips if a vehicle is broken down, as well as the cost of our of our current driver. Um, we do have uh, RFPs out for three separate bus companies looking at what it would cost. Um, they're due back in mid-March, what it would cost if they were to do um, the full in-town run and athletics. And then we also ask them to separate it out. 
into just athletics and just the in-town run, and then we'll, we'll send that to the uh, transportation subcommittee. We'll have another meeting. We had a few last, uh, feels like last year, the beginning of this year. So when that information comes back, we'll bring the transportation subcommittee back together to talk about how does this look. Um, you know, Viking Pride had, had you know, <coughs> provided us with vehicles that have been wonderful for us to use, and, and we're not, um, we're not looking at just taking those vehicles and saying, okay, well, this didn't work out, because it has worked out for us in a number of ways. What we need to make sure is we're not overspending on transportation <coughs> if we don't have to. So we have to correct some of those um, systems and, and efficiencies with our trips. Um, and so I'm not quite there yet to make a, a, a suggestion to the committee as to, as to how to move forward. I would like the subcommittee to be able to look, uh, to look at that from both an athletic perspective, a town in town run perspective, um, and then what, how those costs uh, are comparatively to each other, and then uh, have some further conversation around sort of the rules of, of transportation and what this district is obligated to do uh, in terms of transporting students versus what's sort of the right thing to do, what's the most uh, community based, efficient. And, and right thing to do for the for the town for safety. I think we just we do need to have some more vetting of that process uh, before we make any any final decisions. And special ed transportation is um, t totally different. Final question is on uh, uh, you know the perfect world. We'd like to have our own business manager. Mm -hmm. and we brought up uh, many of the reasons we would like that relative to grant writing and so forth. Right. Have we addressed any type of a part time situation or? Uh, yeah. So, um, working, you know, working with Susan and working with Michael and really going through every inch of the budget. Um, I'm not going to say the budget's not complicated. Um, um, it's a, about 79% of the budget is salaries. Uh, that doesn't mean it's just you don't have to look at that again because you do. You look at that continuously at the ebb and flow of teaching staff as they come and go and, and <coughs> people retire and uh, people move with step in lanes. I believe that there is there is a need for a different style, perhaps, of business management oversight um, that's a little bit more interactive, and that's something um, that I've been working on. Michael and I have worked on having more discussion as opposed to more, you know, consultation. Um, so more more to come on that. And would I make it a priority over a curriculum coordinator or over additional teaching staff at this point, I would not. Um, I don't think we're in the perfect situation. I don't think it's the best use of consolidation. Um, I find some, some conflict there, which is just natural. Um, I have faith in the new appointment as the town manager, uh, that the process will be open and the discussion will be open, so I have some more faith there than I did when I first um, came in. Not that I just didn't have a trust factor there. I wasn't sure how the town CFO really worked with the school. Um, Susan is uh, very aware of this budget, very savvy with the budget. Um, Susan has about 37 other jobs that go on top of that. Which <coughs> had she, if she did not have those 37 other jobs, I'd be very confident that Susan could do that job uh, every single day and, and we could buy a, a license twice a year to do the end of the year report and anything else that needed to be signed by a certified school business manager. Um, and then having that consultation, perhaps with a, a, an auditor who would be able to give us a, a check and balance, you know, once a month. Um, so we're still we're still vetting that out right now. Our contribution to the town um, CFO is not uh, not large. I believe it's about twenty thousand um, dollars. So I, I have made no no change suggestions in that area as of yet. Um, but once we see what the total school budget is, there may be some, some suggestions about how to change that. Thank you, Lisa. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> right? Okay. Good, sir. So based upon the last budget subcommittee meeting, we had taken a vote to, um, to uh, present the uh, needs budget in the amount of 21675488 right? Yes. Okay. 
Opposite thousand. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. Big difference. Yeah. Enough. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Twenty one million six hundred seventy five thousand four hundred eighty four hundred eighty eight dollars. That's a motion. Do I have second. a second? Seconded by Miss Swope. Any further discussion on the motion? Miss Hames, you please call the roll. Yes. Mr. Matucci. Yes. Ms. Powell. Yes. Miss Swope. Yes. Mr. Vecchia. Yes. Mr. Capabianco. Yes. The motion is approved. Thank you. Right. Moving on, we do have two buildings and grounds uh, requests tonight. The first is for the uh, eight from the ATC PTO for a family movie night. Uh, that event is on Friday, March 23rd, 2018. And they're asking that we consider waiving the $500 fee to show the film Wonder. Uh, it's a movie that inspires kindness and tolerance, which they believe is relevant and important themes for our students. Uh, so we have a, a motion to approve that. Motion to approve. Motion by Ms. Powell. Second. Second by Mr. Martucci. Any further discussions? Mr. Capaviego, if, if I may, um, I had some discussion with Ryan Herity around the movie, and um, I saw it for the first time myself last weekend. I wanted to preview the movie to see what it was like. Um, I think being a, a former special ed director, should I, I think I still am actually a special ed director, just mm -hmm. my inner being, um, there is probably no better movie to show and, and the timeliness of this is so critical. And so to waive the fee, to me, um, is we're getting all kinds of stuff for free when you show this movie. It is a, it is a powerful, powerful movie um, that I watched with my son alone in the living room. And I was amazed at his reaction at 10. So he's 10. And the movie is about, if you don't know, it's about a little boy who has a syndrome that makes him look different and he wears, um, he wears a, helmet over his head and pretends he's going up into space. And so he wears it sort of as a joke to pretend he's being dressed up all the time, but what he's doing is he's hiding his physical look. And I won't give you any more detail on the movie, but boy, that was one of the best, probably the best movie I've ever seen. Um, and I think it would change a lot of our kids and enlighten a lot of our parents as to that old you know, saying that we don't judge a book by its cover. Um, and by the end of the movie, I mean, my son has not stopped talking about it. He brings it up because he probably thinks he's getting on points that he's remembering and he's doing the right thing. But it, it sticks. It's a movie that you can't walk away from without um, being changed. And I strongly recommend. I saw it last everybody weekend too. It was great. Did you it's see it? Great movie, yeah. Bo box of tissues. Uh, box of tissues during the movie, but it comes out. But if you stick through it to the end, yeah. um, you come out with a good feeling. You know. I don't know if I'm going to watch it twice because it is a little moving, uh, <laughs> but it's definitely a, a great movie, so I strongly recommend that. All right, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. We also received a uh, request in from, from uh, Yvonne Sonaro, representing Winark. Uh, the Special Olympics <coughs> uh, request in the, I believe, the Gorman Fort Banks Gymnasium for the following dates, March 4th, 11th, 18th, 25th, and April 1st, 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th. Uh, they have all the pre proper paperwork. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the request? Motion. Motion by Mr. Martucci, Second. seconded by Ms. Swoop. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, abstentions? All guys out. Are you going to waive their fee as well? Yeah, waive their fee. Oh, yeah, so that was the way their fee. Okay, great. All right, superintendent's report. Okay, you guys knew that this was gonna be a long one tonight, so, um, and I, I will be uh, as brief as I can, but I, I did not give a superintendent's report at the last meeting, so I wanted to fill you in on a few things. Um, as you're aware, uh, we were all faced with yet another um, school-related tragedy with the Parkland, Florida school shooting. Unfortunately, this has become uh, sort of all too common in our world. Uh, it, it is important, um, for you, and it is important for parents as well to know um, that we do have protocols in place within the Winter Public Schools, and we are confident as educators, as administrators, as teachers, uh, that our schools are secure. We have an excellent and fluid relationship with the police and fire department in the town, and they continuously provide us with support, updates, uh, and, and support around our practice, answers to our questions when we have them <coughs> in our school, SRO, uh, is with us every day. 
With each new unfortunate event, we do uh, get together with colleagues, with the police, with the fire department, and other community members and other communities to continually update our plans and take a look at what we have, see whether or not we need to tweak things, add things, or change any of our practice. Um, this week, uh, I had the opportunity to, to be part of a round table with superintendents from Riviere, uh, Somerville, Chelsea, Malden, Medford, Saugus, Everett, and Boston Public Schools. Uh, Boston Public Schools superintendent could not attend, but an assistant superintendent and their security director attended the meeting. Uh, we were all in a text group together. We're, it's the Snow Bunny text group, so we kind of text each other when it's snowing. As the rookie, I'm usually the last one. I wait to see how many people cancel, and then I kind of jump on. Um, but it was a very powerful group this week. Tom Scott, who's the director of MASS, Mass Association of School Superintendents, participated as well. Um, we asked him to participate because even though we're superintendents, we don't always know how to react. We don't always know what to say to parents. Um, and there were a few. There are a few topics uh, that will be coming up. So, based on the uh, most recent event, one was uh, just how to respond to some of the requests about safety that our parents are asking us. Two, how to plan for uh, the notion of walkouts. Uh, as you are aware, there are many coalitions and groups that are organizing uh, walkouts for students as a result of the Florida tragedy. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're mindful in responding to these uh, walkouts or thoughts of our students and our teaching staff, uh, as many people uh, are feeling empowered to do so uh, for a number of reasons. So the walks are Wednesday, March 14th, the Coalition of Women um, for uh, Youth Empowerment announced the national, that that would be the National School Walkout Day. Saturday, March 24th, there is a student-led group organized um, called March for Our Lives on the Boston Common. And on Friday, April 20th, uh, there is a network for public education group uh, that is encouraging people to take a stand, enough is enough is their, their motto, hashtag enough is enough, uh, against violence um, as April 20th marks uh, the Columbine tragedy as well. So all of these things sort of coming before us uh, need, need to be addressed by administration, especially at the middle and high school level where our students have a voice. So I wanted to give you uh, a little bit of an update on what we have done here in Winthrop over the past two weeks and how we've been communicating with each other. Um, on, the, on Winthrop Public Schools side, uh, we sent out an email, I sent out an email to staff on the 15th, February 15th, uh, regarding um, the Florida tragedy with resources and just some kind words to our staff to, to uh, let them know that Winthrop Public Schools uh, is saddened uh, and, and is praying for the people in Florida um, and to, to keep an eye on our kids and to provide them with some resources that they could share with students and parents as well as themselves. I also sent an email to all the parents in the district and I checked today and uh, 1,875 emails were uh, read or, or went through, so someone opened them. And um, those went by a Connect Ed. And that was a, a short um, email talking about the fact, acknowledging the fact about what happened and explaining to parents that we are safe, we feel as though we are a safe school, but also giving them a link to resources that was provided by uh, the National Psychological Association and uh, MASS had also vetted it out and other schools were sending that to parents. And it's just Q's and Q and A's. What do you say to your kids? What age level? Um, I did a follow-up email the Friday before vacation to staff to uh, ask them to um, try to relax over the vacation and to come back uh, feeling good about themselves but also ready to review protocols and, and be mindful of what the rules and regulations are in the schools. All school safety protocols were collected by me uh, right uh, on the 15th and each um, and reviewed by me I want to let you know that each building has conducted several meetings several meeting between two and five depending upon the school evacuations hold in place procedures and lockdown since the beginning of the school year practiced by the teaching staff along with the students um, and, and principals it's, it should be noted that the police department participates in those so if there is a lockdown, it's a practice, you may see eight to 10 police officers in the school. Um, we don't go into detail about 
the lockdowns and um, and what the procedures look like, um, where students are sent, how that process works, um, because the specifics of security training and employment of different practices that we use um, become public record when we begin to talk about them publicly or provide them to people. And Chief Delahanty and Chief Flanagan, um, not only this year but years past, have informed us of not making those things public because they really would breach the security and put our kids at risk. And that can be very frustrating for parents. Um, I also met with uh, Chief Delahanty and Chief Flanagan today to review the safety updates that have been done. Um, not just the new school building, the new middle school uh, has uh, safety um, and security that is very strong, but what updates have been done in the past uh, few years at the Gorman Fort Banks and at the Arthur T. Cummings, and both felt very strongly that the practice that was put in place over the past three years, such as checking locks during a, during a, a hold in place, um, making sure people's fobs were working appropriately, making sure people weren't putting wedges in doors at any time, making sure doors were locked and rooms were labeled. So there's certain things that, um, that they need to know and then a much higher level of, of security practice that has been, been put in place, are those things still working? And um, we met today to talk about that and they both communicated to me that they feel strongly that we are continuing to head in the right direction. Um, however, we can always improve. So with every incident, you look at what you're doing. Um, and then you look at the new things that uh, are rolled out in different districts and what companies or, or support systems like NEMLIC, which is a, a national uh, security uh, sort of guide and protocol being used in certain districts. You, we're always mindful of what other people are doing to see if that would be a good fit here in Winthrop. Um, I can honestly report that that team of people, those decisions are not made in a silo. They're not made by an individual principal. Uh, or by an individual teacher, or based on a, a, a concern by one parent. They're made as a collective group, uh, always in, including the police and fire department. And town, the town workers are also involved uh, because of um, evacuations and where our students need to go. Uh, but again, we can always tweak and we can always remind uh, our staff. So this week, the teaching staff uh, will continue to be reminded about the practices and reviewing their protocols and making sure if they have questions that they go directly uh, to, the, to the superintendent, uh, to, I'm sorry, to the principal of their building. As far as the marches are concerned, um, lots of conversation with Mr. Crombie and, and um, some other folks on <coughs> what we tell our students. You know, we are encouraging students, we want to educate students to have a voice um, in, in government, to have a voice in their school, to have a voice about their safety, to have a voice in general. Um, and not just the group that I met with today, but also the superintendent's group on the North Shore, I felt very strongly that um, having, having policies in place in schools for students not to walk out of school for any reason, not to walk out because you're mad at a teacher, not to walk out because you didn't like your report card, not to walk out because there's a coalition of people that said you need to do this to make a statement. Um, there have been policies put in place to prevent that uh, from happening. What we don't want to prevent is the voice of a child or the voice of a staff member uh, around something that they're passionate about. So um, the March 14th Women's March is on a school day. It is highly publicized in social media. Um, there are educators that are encouraging students to walk out. There are non-educators. Um, I have a little bit of a fear about 700 people walking out of a building on a known date and time and standing publicly uh, outside to make a stand. I have concern about the safety around that. <coughs> I also have a concern about our students not having their, their voice heard. Um, so uh, Mr. Crombie will be meeting with students and staff tomorrow. I'll be meeting with the union to talk about uh, on the 14th, how can we empower their voice with something and we have ideas about what we can put in place to give the students an alternative but choice. So an alternative to say, I still need to say something about this. I still need to do something about this. I still want to be heard. Um, I don't want to get in trouble, because if I walk out of school, now I have a consequence. Yet we have colleges that are now writing saying, you won't be consequenced. That's nice. We'll see if they remember that when you graduate, because I'm not sure if they will. Um, so we do want to give our, our students the opportunity um, to have that voice. But we want them to help create the opportunity. So Matt's working with them tomorrow. He has put together, Mr. Crumby 
has put together a um, student safety subcommittee before, I, before the walkout stuff came about of students where those students um, meeting with him monthly to talk about what they think needs to improve the safety or what they don't know enough about in terms of safety in the school uh, or outside the school on our athletic fields or in our uh, theaters. Um, and so this group as well as um, our student government group will, will all be asked about the 14th. What are you thinking? What are you thinking of doing? Can we talk to you about why that might not be a good idea? So at least arm the students with the right to understand. If you do walk out, which some students do, or teaching staff walks out, we're st we still are going to follow the rules, but we want to give you another venue to be heard. Lisa, the, on the 14th, what exactly is the, is this walkout supposed to do? Is it supposed to be just outside the school and make some type of yeah. a statement, or is this so it's like a symbolic? Yeah. So what I what I have um, <coughs> been sent about social media and and what I've talked to the other superintendents about is. The, the women's movement, the women's march is saying. Just point clear, the folks that organize the women's march are part of that. They're the ones doing the Saturday event. They do both, right? No, no, just the Saturday event, not the Wednesday event. They're doing the Saturday rally at the Common. They're not doing the walkout. They're encouraging students to do the, the Saturday, Saturday event. One? Okay, because we got we have no. No, no, they're today. doing the Common one. Okay. To my knowledge, yeah. someone. Okay, because I get an email today saying that they were the coalition behind the um, March Youth Empowerment. That's different. The women's folks. Oh, it's I'm two sorry, different I groups. That, yeah, right? yeah two the different women's groups. groups are the same. Correct. So, so the, um, the the march for the youth empowerment one on the 14th. They're expected to walk outside for 17 seconds and uh, to minutes. represent the 17 minutes to represent the 17 uh, lost lives, and it's very symbolic. Um, and then they have to come back into the building. What we've learned is that most uh, most walkouts don't result in students coming back into the building. A lot of times movements are not, they're, they're sort of followed by people who don't really know why they're walking out. So we want to make sure that the students are well aware of what the, what the point is. Um, and also make them well aware of you can still have a symbolic representation. But let's have a symbolic representation with some change. You know, what's the change agent there? Because after you symbolically stand outside for 17 minutes and someone takes your picture and puts it on Facebook, what change have you actually affected? So we want our students to be able to reach out to our state senators, Speaker of the House, perhaps anybody else who, who is a community member and works uh, at the State House who, who would maybe want to hear from our students, whether it be in writing or whether it be by voice. So giving them a different venue of not walking out the door, but perhaps walking to a spot within the school to be able to sign a petition and the kids are going to make this up, this is just some suggestions that we have, but to be able to maybe sign a petition that goes to the State House, or to be able to uh, sign a condolence on a, on a large piece of paper that we may then send to Florida. Uh, but to be able to make some statement about why they don't want this to happen anymore, and, and, and that they feel terrible that it has happened. Uh, but we need the kids to build that, and then and also uh, sort of give them the understanding that if they do walk out, which they have a choice, they, they will have to endure a consequence, and so we're still working on that. We are going to uh, encourage them if they want to do the public uh, part of that because of the amount of security we believe will be on Boston Common, um, that that would be an event because it happens to be on a Saturday. Um, that would be an event that they would receive no consequence, and it's a much larger venue where I believe there will be speeches and there will be information and, and more of an educational opportunity than just sort of that snapshot of I've made a symbol by stepping myself. I think the kids, they're probably going to want to try to do as much as they can on this 14th right. because they want to say, this is my school, Correct. that kind of a thing. When you go to a walk at the commons, you kind of get lost in the crowd, right, so to right. speak. So I think there's probably going to be many that really want right. to make a statement. So. And that's why we want their voice about how that will roll out, as opposed to us saying, we don't want you to walk out, so we're going to put you in the gym. Like that, that's really not going to be helpful because they're not creating it. They're not key stakeholders in an event leading to a message, leading to change. Um, and that's really what we're looking for is making it an educational moment. We're not losing. It's not about the 17 minutes of school time. It really isn't. It's about a, the voice of children and, and adults in public education about what really needs to be done to keep our students safe. That need that message really needs to be communicated strongly because what the kids are going to hear 
you know what they're going to hear. Of course. Which is they you're trying to that. stop you're them. Trying to stop us. Right. So, so the delivery of the message, it's all in the power of delivery, in my opinion, um, really has to come from the kids. Yeah. You know, we have some concerns, real concerns, about them being physically outside that building at that day, at that time. And that's just real. That's parental, that's, you know, school teachery, that you worry about them. Um, and that we want them to have a voice. And we, we have some really, really bright kids and some really invested kids that do have a voice and that have great ideas. We need to give them time to figure that out. And it's gonna, it's short time because of the, of the month. If, if I may, I think it's, a, it's definitely important for our students if they feel passionate to be able to use their First Amendment rights. And I think it's important if they want to do that to be most effective. And I think that Saturday event mm -hmm. is going to be extremely organized, as we right. saw with the Women's March. Right, right. Uh, <clears throat> there was 175,000 people there, yeah. and I felt extremely safe. Yep. And as we all learned, crowd size matters. That's, that's effective. Right. If you have a couple kids walk out of a couple schools... <clears throat> that doesn't get the message across as you need it. You know, you need to, if you want to get your message across, it needs to be organized. Yeah, uh, maybe, so maybe throughout the community, we could seek some donations, uh, maybe sponsor a bus or, or something like that if some kids want to go to the common. So we're um, participating again in another round table with the superintendents on Thursday um, to see what other like communities are doing because there may be opportunity for our students to, to jump on if we be here. Uh, or Chelsea are, are sending students, they may be organizing something. So we're all, superintendents are always looking at efficiencies. So we're looking at if people are going to be doing a large ride into Boston um, to be able to provide information about that. What I can tell you is our students have not come forward in, in large groups yet to say that they want to do this, but we're not waiting for that. Yeah. We've had one or two kids inquire, we've had a couple of adults inquire, but we, we really need to give them the opportunity to think about that before it's too late before it's the 14th at 9 o'clock and they hear about it for the first time. Yeah, they're, they are planning on it, yeah. I've heard. Yeah, so, and they're, uh, aren't they, they're smooth because they haven't, they haven't come forward uh, too much yet. So that's why we're reaching out to them to ask them. And if I may, I think it's important to, to try and convey to them that we're ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. What they're fighting for in Florida is different. In Massachusetts, you cannot buy an AR-17. You cannot buy a weapon of war. Right. We, you know, Massachusetts, once again, is a leader in that. Right. So, you know, our, our goal is to let our students from, in, in, with some support of our history teachers, to be very mindful and careful of politics and not wanting to push an opinion on anybody, but to allow the students to be able to speak about that and give them their, their opportunity. So um, that is the update uh, on uh, where we're at with uh, some of our facilities, I'm sorry, some of our safety work, just revisiting, feeling very confident in the fact that our teachers are understanding their protocols, that they're practicing them, that we're not waiting for things to happen and then reacting um, and, and continuing that plight forward and sharing information as we, as we can. Um, in terms of a uh, couple of other little things, facilities and maintenance, um, facilities seems to be sort of like a side job for me now um, in working with all of our facility guys who are amazing and spend a tremendous amount of time probably off the clock actually doing work in the schools, we've had a few issues. Uh, bathroom on the first floor of the high school, uh, off of the um, off of the workout room, uh, it has a plumbing issue that has required um, a lot of work. It was found sort of accidentally. Uh, it was in one of the um, accessible facilities, the handicapped accessible facility. Uh, there was a clog, and as they tried to repair the clog and did multiple flushing, which is not something apparently that happens in that accessible toilet, that an actual one, um, daily they discovered that there was much more than a clog in there that you wouldn't have otherwise found unless you multiply flushed a toilet as a plumber would do to make sure the systems are working. Um, and there is uh, some uh, backup in, in that bathroom that needs to be taken care of behind a wall. And so we have the, um, we've talked to Gil Bain, we have the insurance <coughs> company out. Um, these people are, are probably saying, what's going on? Why are they picking apart everything we've done in the school building project? But we are. Uh, so uh, we are going to have to take down a piece of the wall. The bathroom is closed, and, and that's for um, hygiene reasons. We don't want kids, although we could close off that exact toilet. makes sense to close the whole bathroom. We have plenty of bathrooms. The bathroom is not closed because people are vaping, which was a rumor. It's nothing to do with vaping and e-cigarettes and everything to do with a clogged toilet, for lack of better terms. However, 
Um, we think there's some structural, the, the plumber thinks there's some structural issues there that are part of the building project, so we are back on um, elbows and corners of pipes and things I really never knew a lot about <coughs> and I now feel like I know too much about. Uh, we have also um, had it, they completed the slides on the chairs, so principals are very mindful of the slides on their chairs and scratching of the floors because the facility staff is all over people if the floors are being scratched and the chairs are not being put up properly. What we found is the slides on all of the chairs in the middle school and high school um, were uh, not defective, but not what we really thought we were getting in terms of quality. And so they replaced them. They replaced some, but not all. And they just this past weekend, I was in there Sunday, and they were finishing. Um, but what we thought was finished wasn't totally finished because they missed about 72 chairs, to be exact. Uh, yeah. So uh, they were coming back to finish those 72 chairs. We've also asked them, because we've had to have them come back a number of times, <coughs> some extras um, for no charge because we know that some of those are going to pop off. So we have, uh, that seems to be rectified to a degree, um, and the sounds are better. We're not scraping floors and making noises that we shouldn't be making. Uh, you have in your packet the playground information, still staying on facilities, just uh, not quickly, but <coughs> the inspection company, Playground inspectors of New England that did the original inspection a couple of years ago on that uh, on the uh, coming school playground and put out a report that sort of sat somewhere. And so somebody said you have to read it, and we read it and we learned that there were things in that playground uh, that uh, could cause harm to students, could ha cause harm to students, and we had the facility uh, person who did the actual evaluation of the park come back out and explain what that really meant, a level one, a level two. There was some scary language in the actual report. Um, as she came out to talk to us about that, we also had to walk through the park to look at the updates that we had made, let us know if there was anything there that she still felt was a, a detriment uh, to a child. In the end, we know that the, uh, the playground itself right now we have taken a slide off that, we, that had a hole in it that we didn't want anybody's hoodie string to get caught in because that's a level one, meaning a child could get caught in that and choke. The surface, the ground surface, is supposed to bounce a little bit. It's supposed to be a little bit bouncy so that if a child falls off a structure, they don't fall and just stop. The child himself is supposed to bounce a little bit. It's lost its elasticity, for lack of better terms. Um, so there's a, uh, it becomes a level one when the elasticity is sort of gone. Um, not that it's that way in every single spot, but in testable spots it is. Uh, we, have, uh, we have repaired swings, we have taken swings off, anything that could uh, cut a child, um, we have removed. And when she came back out, she said, you did a nice job, but in the long run, this park gets a tremendous amount of use before school, after school, during the summer, at night. They, we have cameras because we have, some, have had some issues of kids being there at night, older children. Parks and Rec uses it a lot. Um, it's a major usable space. Uh, and the strong recommendation uh, was that nothing is going to get better on its own. You, you could continue to replace a few things, but that surface has to be fully replaced. So we asked them to give us an estimate on a retrofit, which means keeping some of our existing um, structures and then retrofitting um, tearing up what we have and sort of retrofitting around the existing structures. And again, another thing that I really didn't want to know a whole lot about, but I do, is how you piece those things together and how that whole process works and why it's more expensive almost to retrofit because in the long run, you're going to end up removing the structures because of the amount of use. And then you have to tear up the retrofit ground and then it's no longer compatible or, or quote, safe. Uh, so we did ask for a full retrofit um, uh, cost estimate as well as a full park replacement cost estimate, keeping the park in similar to what it is now. Uh, we've also, so that came back to us. Um, I believe it's in your packet. I believe um, the estimate, again, it's an estimate, was uh, $225 if you were to tear the whole place out uh, right down to the ground and resurface and put all new equipment in and make it 100% uh, accessible. Uh, for, uh, for students and adults with disabilities. And then uh, the other option was to uh, retrofit it and sort of piecemeal to get it compliant, but with no real long-term you know, usability of it. It, it. Eventually, things are gonna go again. 
these are estimates. We've also asked another company. Um, these companies are hard to find, believe it or not, that do complete parks um, in, in small parks, because this is not a large school park compared to, to the rest. Um, so we're still waiting on another estimate. In the meantime, I've had conversations with the town manager around cost, because this is not an anticipated cost, $200,000, not, not an easy one. Uh, the rest of the parks, the reason the original inspection was done was because the rest of the parks in the community were being rehabbed and being fixed. And as part of the inspection of all the parks, Mr. Macero, the former superintendent, asked them to include our two school parks in that sort of assessment. So, so we sort of jumped in uh, to find out how our parks looked as well. So in the meantime, all the other parks were done and brought up to compliance and looked really, really good. Um, we did the Mariana Fabiano Park, which we've had to make some renovations to minor, and that park is fully compliant. And then we have probably the most usable park in town, which is the Arthur T. Cummings School Park, and sort of the funding was no longer available. The parks the commission that had been put together sort of fizzled out, and the Cummings School Park sat um, sort of like the last thing to get done. So uh, I, I did put together a capital, a draft capital improvement request of the town for this school year, for this year um, and I provided them with a copy of this and will provide them with a copy of, haven't provided it yet, it's the next town council meeting. I need to clean it up a little, I'm hoping I have a new draft uh, from a new estimate from the other company, they've been very slow uh, to get it to us um, and that way I'll have some some information to provide the council to see if in fact there is any way we can have some support from the town where it is a, a park that's used every day of the year uh, by multiple uh, users, not just students in grades three to five. So um, once I have that conversation and get a beat on, on whether or not there is any ability to, to get some funding for that, I can then plan to move forward. Eventually, we will shut that park down because eventually the little bit of elasticity that is left, little on, is equal to none, pretty much. I have checked with uh, uh, Maya, M-I-A-A, around our uh, liability in keeping the park open and what does that mean, um, and I am confident that based on what it looks like right now and our oversight of it and our oversight of students while they're on it, that we are in good space uh, allowing our students. We will never let our students on equipment that they will, you know, be heard on and nobody's watching them and we're not paying attention. Um, but eventually another, something else is gonna break and eventually uh, we're, we're not gonna be able to provide the oversight that needs to be provided. We've also incorporated a weekly uh, check since reading that evaluation. So custodians at every school playground are out there every week with a checklist of what, anything that broke, any screw that fell off, any exposure uh, that's there and those get reported back to the building principal and are addressed within that week. And if something can't be addressed, it's closed. You said, was there a difference between the, the complete makeover and you know, piecemealing it together in terms of warranty on the equipment? So a lot of the equipment would be existing equipment that we have that we can still use, um, and the, um, the, the longevity of the ground, <coughs> so that, that, um, that full surface that you would put down, longevity of, um, of that ground is different when you do a retrofit because it's different material. Mm -hmm. um, and it'd be really cool if I could tell you what the material is, but I can't remember off the top of my head uh, what it is. Some of it is, uh, is uh, wood chips in, in one portion of it, which is not the best for accessibility. For we have, we have parents who need accessibility, who need to be able to roll onto the, onto the uh, to push their child in a swing. I need to be able to roll onto that area and we'd be putting wood chips down. There'd be accessibility, but not, not accessibility that would be in the best interest of our uh, students and families. So more, more to come on that. Uh, we are gonna get some information, more information. We try to update our parents at the coming school uh, to avoid uh, assumptions. And uh, we've been pretty good with that. Uh, but I, I, we really didn't have a lot more to give them. Ryan will be sending out an email so that they're aware of that list. Parents have been great. You know, anything you need, any support you need, and we just want to make sure we have a plan in place and then we can say this is what, what we would need in terms of extra support. And I think, I'll paper, that might be it. Um, Lisa, 
in the music room is all back together and okay. so it's as of uh, as of Saturday they were hoping to have kids back in the music room today um, I was up a little annoyed with the fact that they didn't clean up after themselves so when I went there to see I mean if you take a room apart because you have to fix it and you have to put up new walls you should put it back together I think my parents might have taught me that but um, so there was still materials in the hallways and there was still um, some equipment in the hallways all of our music equipment is not back yet um, but I, I'm not sure if the students went in there today or not Brian would know that but we're very very close to having them back in the classroom any personnel um, are we back to the agenda or are you still on me no we're back to the agenda all right so good so that was, I know that's probably the longest superintendent's report I've had in a while. <coughs> I, I, there were quite a few things to get out there. Uh, personnel, yes. So we have um, a few postings. The interim athletic director, our athletic director, who was awesome, um, took a job in a hospital working as a, a PA. So she, uh, she resigned, so we're trying to replace that. So that has been uh, posted and in, in trained. Is that what I'm supposed to be? <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yeah. No. Good thing we're not whispering. What the hell? Right? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> right? Matt, Matt, you, I mean, you didn't just get let go. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, spend yeah. too much quality <laughs> time together. Yeah. So the interim athletic trainer, trainer, which is very different than the athletic director, um, is uh, she's now working as similar to a PA uh, in a hospital. So uh, she did a great job for us. So we are interviewing. I believe those interviews, some of those interviews, had taken place. So this has been posted. All of our, um, we had a list of fall athletic positions that we already posted, so I think this is a, a repeat in the packet. Um, we also have the student council you already did, and then we have somebody who is taking, who is on a leave of absence who has since resigned. Kelly Flynn. I'm sorry? Kelly Flynn. Oh, Kelly Flynn, right. Um, an elementary school teacher um, who did a great job for us. So she will, I'm sorry, at the uh, <coughs> So she will not be second grade. Yep, not be returning uh, next year. And we'll post. She she had a long term sub in there now because she was gone for the whole year anyway. But she's informing us that uh, she's going to stay home and raise her children uh, and, and not return. So that will be posted for full time beginning in September. And I believe that's it. All right. Uh, moving on to new business, we do have a school committee training uh, date on March 1st at 4 p.m. Uh, with Glenn Kucher, who is excellent. He's the executive director of uh, Mass Association of so Massachusetts Association of New School Committees. Uh, that location is to be determined. Um, I it's that it'll be in the principal's oh, conference. Oh, it's principal's room. conference. Now. Okay. Um, I did have a great conversation today with Paul Hodnett uh, regarding the superintendent's contract. We will be having a superintendent's contract uh, negotiation subcommittee meeting at some point next week. Just depends uh, when everyone's availability is. Um, and I'd like to make a motion to waive the first reading of the revived substance abuse use prevention and education policy. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Powell. Any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Uh, any unfinished business? Public comment? Uh, public relations, Mr. Matucci? All said, sir. Thank you. I'll just like to remind everyone to attend Band Together, a fundraiser on March 10th uh, from 7 to 11 at the Winter Elks. Uh, it's a great event uh, in support of Winter Instrumental Music Program. Fantastic. Yes, this Saturday our high school is sponsoring the State Drama Festival, which is very exciting and opportunity to show off our school. And the students will be having a public performance on Thursday night of Faustus at 8 p.m. And that will take place at the high school. Um, great. It will be a great show. I'm sure they're, they're writing it themselves. There's going to be a vaping presentation March 8th at 6 p.m., which would be good for all not only the high school, but also the middle school and even maybe the elementary parents to be encouraged to attend. And then kudos to our hockey team, boys and girls, basketball team, boys and girls are all participating in the first round of state championships this week. So, does it affect you? Nope. I just have one thing that I want to add, sorry, make it this longer than I have to, but the whole uh, Matt Serino thing threw me a little bit and I did want to make a comment about Matt Serino. That's probably why I had the little block there. 
Um, he is our athletic director, as you know, and randomly, um, the MIAA does observations of events that are run by a public school, and it's, it's sort of like a pop quiz where they show up at one of your events and they, they rate you. And I got a copy of that rating, um, and some of the comments, it was an A-plus rating, and some of the comments were uh, great announcements, att great attendance, um, awesome expectations of behavior communicated by the person who does the announcements. Beautiful gym, very well staffed, such a family friendly atmosphere. This AD runs a tight ship, quality, quality event. So that's kudos to Matt Serino and I'll tell you why. He spends an inordinate amount of time after school hours and on the weekends making sure our events are well staffed, making sure people aren't dropping popcorn on the floor, people aren't eating in the gym, not leaving Dunkin' Donut coffee cups places. He works closely with the, uh, with the custodial staff, is mindful of the work that they have to do when an event is over. Um, and I, I can't <coughs> say enough about that reflection. It is a true reflection of what he does as an athletic director. I can honestly say that. Um, and then one more little piece. Jackie Lamont from the DA's office is coming out on March 1st the coming school from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. And uh, we're doing an event called Let's Talk Safety to our parents. And it surrounds, it's uh, about discussions on um, social media for kids and, and what we're doing. We've already done that with Screen Ages, so that was our kickoff doing the Screen Ages event. But having Jackie come out to address also um, child abuse and what what is, uh, how, how do you, recognize the signs of child abuse. We've had some, some media attention and some news lately about uh, some things that have happened in other communities that folks may try, you know, may tie to this community at some point, may not, I hope not. Um, but parents are asking questions about how do they recognize if their child is feeling unsafe and um, Jackie from the DA's office has come out, uh, we asked her to come out and talk to our parents about those two very specific topics. Um, and it's parents only, so uh, students uh, are not attending that, and the reason behind it is that we want the parents to be able to freely ask questions without making uh, little ones nervous or, or feeling uncomfortable. She does a good job. She came out here. She does a great job. A while back. Yeah. Yeah. And it's needed. We've had, I've had some questions from parents, what, you know, what do I look for? You know, how do I know? And, and I'm a parent, but I certainly am not somebody who has, has dealt with that. And so we felt best to offer that to our parents. And, I believe it will be well attended. Can you repeat the date? Sure, it's March 1st, 6.30 to 7.30 at the coming school. Um, and um, Mr. Harrity and uh, Mr. Curley are uh, spearheading that. So that should, be, that should be good for our parents. So just another outreach to our parents, I think, is critical. And that's all I have. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Okay. Motion by Mr. Matucci, second by President Vecchia. All opposed? Objection oh. standing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All opposed. <laughs>